Hello again and welcome back. This is day number 182, and today we read 1 Kings 13 and 14, our tenth reading in Psalm 119, and our first reading in John 8. Welcome to the readings today, and I send my love out to you, my brother or sister. So let's open to 1 Kings 13. King Solomon was the wisest of men, so how could he make such stupid choices? Part of the answer is the corruption caused when one has too much power. And there is something truly sticky about sexual sin. The Lord's judgment is evident in what happened with the division of the country and what happened in the northern kingdom. Note also how the people of Judah followed all the bad parts of Solomon's example, which again will lead to judgment. 1 Kings 13 At the Lord's command, a prophet from Judah went to Bethel and arrived there as Jeroboam stood at the altar to offer the sacrifice. Following the Lord's command, the prophet denounced the altar. O altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A child whose name will be Josiah will be born to the family of David. He will slaughter on you the priests serving at the pagan altars who offer sacrifices on you, and he will burn human bones on you. And the prophet went on to say, this altar will fall apart, and the ashes on it will be scattered. Then you will know that the Lord has spoken through me. When King Jeroboam heard this, he pointed at him and ordered, Seize that man! At once the king's arm became paralyzed so that he couldn't pull it back. The altar suddenly fell apart and the ashes spilled to the ground, as the prophet had predicted in the name of the Lord. King Jeroboam said to the prophet, Please pray for me to the Lord your God and ask him to heal my arm. The prophet prayed to the Lord, and the king's arm was healed. Then the king said to the prophet, Come home with me and have something to eat. I will reward you for what you have done. The prophet answered, Even if you gave me half your wealth, I would not go with you or eat or drink anything with you. The Lord has commanded me not to eat or drink a thing, and not to return home the same way I came. So he did not go back the same way he had come, but by another road. At that time there was an old prophet living in Bethel. His sons came and told him what the prophet from Judah had done in Bethel that day and what he had said to King Jeroboam. The old prophet asked them, Which way did he go when he left? They showed him the road, and he told them to saddle his donkey for him. They did so, and he rode off down the road after the prophet from Judah and found him sitting under an oak tree. He asked, Are you the prophet from Judah? I am, the man answered. Come home and have a meal with me. But the prophet from Judah answered, I can't go home with you or accept your hospitality, and I won't eat or drink anything with you here, because the Lord has commanded me not to eat or drink a thing and not to return home the same way I came. Then the old prophet from Bethel said to him, I too am a prophet just like you, and at the Lord's command, an angel told me to take you home with me and offer you my hospitality. But the old prophet was lying. So the prophet from Judah went home with the old prophet and had a meal with him. As they were sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet, and he cried out to the prophet from Judah, The Lord says that you disobeyed him and did not do what he commanded. Instead, you returned and ate a meal in a place he had ordered you not to eat in. Because of this, you will be killed, and your body will not be buried in your family grave. 
After they had finished eating, the old prophet saddled the donkey for the prophet from Judah, who rode off. On the way a lion met him and killed him. His body lay on the road, and the donkey and the lion stood beside it. Some men passed by and saw the body on the road with the lion standing nearby. They went on to Bethel and reported what they had seen. When the old prophet heard about it, he said, That is the prophet who disobeyed the Lord's command. And so the Lord sent the lion to attack and kill him, just as the Lord said he would. And he said to his sons, Saddle my donkey for me. They did so, and he rode off and found the prophet's body lying on the road, with the donkey and the lion still standing by it. The lion had not eaten the body or attacked the donkey. The old prophet picked up the body, put it on the donkey, and brought it back to Bethel to mourn over it and bury it. He buried it in his own family grave, and he and his sons mourned over it, saying, Oh, my brother, my brother. After the burial, the prophet said to his sons, When I die, bury me in this grave and lay my body next to his. The words that he spoke at the Lord's command against the altar in Bethel and against all the places of worship in the towns of Samaria will surely come true. King Jeroboam of Israel still did not turn from his evil ways, but continued to choose priests from ordinary families to serve at the altars he had built. He ordained as priests anyone who wanted to be one. This sin on his part brought about the ruin and total destruction of his dynasty. 1 Kings 14 At that time, King Jeroboam's son, Abijah, got sick. Jeroboam said to his wife, Disguise yourself so that no one will recognize you, and go to Shiloh, where the prophet Ahijah lives, the one who said I would be king of Israel. Take him ten loaves of bread, some cakes, and a jar of honey. Ask him what is going to happen to our son, and he will tell you. So she went to Ahijah's home in Shiloh. Old age had made Ahijah blind. The Lord had told him that Jeroboam's wife was coming to ask him about her son who was sick, and the Lord told Ahijah what to say. When Jeroboam's wife arrived, she pretended to be someone else. But when Ahijah heard her coming in the door, he said, "'Come in!' I know you are Jeroboam's wife. Why are you pretending to be someone else? I have bad news for you. Go and tell Jeroboam that this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to him. I chose you from among the people and made you the ruler of my people Israel. I took the kingdom away from David's descendants and gave it to you. But you have not been like my servant David, who was completely loyal to me, obeyed my commands, and did only what I approve of. You have committed far greater sins than those who ruled before you. You have rejected me and have aroused my anger by making idols and metal images to worship. Because of this I will bring disaster on your dynasty, and will kill all your male descendants, young and old alike. I will get rid of your family, they will be swept away like dung. Any members of your family who die in the city will be eaten by dogs, and any who die in the open country will be eaten by vultures. I, the Lord, have spoken." And Ahijah went on to say to Jeroboam's wife, Now go back home. As soon as you enter the town, your son will die. All the people of Israel will mourn for him and bury him. He will be the only member of Jeroboam's family who will be properly buried, because he is the only one with whom the Lord, the God of Israel, is pleased. The Lord is going to place a king over Israel who will put an end to Jeroboam's dynasty. 
the Lord will punish Israel, and she will shake like a reed shaking in a stream. He will uproot the people of Israel from this good land which he gave to their ancestors, and he will scatter them beyond the Euphrates River, because they have aroused his anger by making idols of the goddess Asherah. The Lord will abandon Israel because Jeroboam sinned and led the people of Israel into sin. Jeroboam's wife went back to Tirzah. Just as she entered her home, the child died. The people of Israel mourned for him and buried him, as the Lord said through his servant, the prophet Ahijah. Everything else that King Jeroboam did The wars he fought and how he ruled are all recorded in the history of the kings of Israel. Jeroboam ruled as king for twenty-two years. He died and was buried, and his son Nadab succeeded him as king. Solomon's son Rehoboam was forty-one years old when he became king of Judah, and he ruled seventeen years in Jerusalem the city which the Lord had chosen from all the territory of Israel as the place where he was to be worshipped. Rehoboam's mother was Naama from Ammon. The people of Judah sinned against the Lord and did more to arouse his anger against them than all their ancestors had done. They built places of worship for false gods and put up stone pillars and symbols of Asherah to worship on the hills and under shady trees. Worst of all, there were men and women who served as prostitutes at those pagan places of worship. The people of Judah practiced all the shameful things done by the people whom the Lord had driven out of the land as the Israelites advanced into the country. In the fifth year of Rehoboam's reign, King Shishak of Egypt attacked Jerusalem. He took away all the treasures in the temple and in the palace, including the gold shields Solomon had made. To replace them, King Rehoboam made bronze shields and entrusted them to the officers responsible for guarding the palace gates. Every time the king went to the temple, the guards carried the shields and then returned them to the guardroom. Everything else that King Rehoboam did is recorded in the history of the kings of Judah. During all this time, Rehoboam and Jeroboam were constantly at war with each other. Rehoboam died and was buried in the royal tombs in David's city, and his son Abijah succeeded him as king. Let's turn to Psalm 119 for our tenth reading there, starting at verse 145. I like the last three verses of yesterday's reading. Your righteousness will last forever, and your law is always true. I am filled with trouble and anxiety, but your commandments bring me joy. Your instructions are always just. Give me understanding, and I shall live. Psalm 119, starting at verse 145. With all my heart I call to you. Answer me, Lord, and I will obey your commands. I call to you, save me, and I will keep your laws. Before sunrise I call to you for help. I place my hope in your promise. All night long I lie awake to meditate on your instructions. Because your love is constant, hear me, O Lord. Show your mercy and preserve my life. My cruel persecutors are coming closer, people who never keep your law. But you are near to me, Lord, and all your commands are permanent. Long ago I learned about your instructions. You made them to last forever. 
Look at my suffering, please, and save me, because I have not neglected your law. Defend my cause and set me free. Save me as you have promised. The wicked will not be saved, for they do not obey your laws. But your compassion, Lord, is great. Please show me your mercy and save me. I have many enemies and oppressors, but I do not fail to obey your laws. When I look at those traitors, I am filled with disgust, because they do not keep your commands. See how I love your instructions, Lord. Your love never changes, so save me. The heart of your law is truth, and all your righteous judgments are eternal. We turn for the first time to John 8. The temple guards were ordered to arrest Jesus, but when they came back empty-handed, they simply said, We have never heard anyone speak like this. There is a fascinating little detail I just saw in John 7, 37 through 38, as translated by the GNT. Jesus said, Whoever is thirsty should come to me, and whoever believes in me should drink. As the scripture says, streams of life-giving water will pour out from his side. First, I want you to know that the word translated side can be translated as belly or intestines. But since that word was also used as the seat of emotions, it can also be translated into English as heart, which is the word we use for the seat of emotions. But for now, let's keep the word side. Streams of life-giving water will pour out from his side. Whose side is Jesus' meaning? Here's one of those double meanings I mentioned as a feature of this gospel. As most often understood and translated, streams of living water will flow from the believer's inner being. Whoever believes in me should drink. But when Jesus was stabbed by the spear in chapter 19, John made a big deal that he saw both water and blood flow out. The his side that Jesus could be meaning is his own side. Jesus could have meant either, or he could have intentionally given one of the most precious double meanings of all. In either case, whether the water comes from the believer or from Jesus' side, they are a sign of the Holy Spirit. John 8 then everyone went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early the next morning he went back to the temple. All the people gathered around him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught committing adultery, and they made her stand before them all. They said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. In our law, Moses commanded that such a woman must be stoned to death. Now what do you say? They said this to trap Jesus so that they could accuse him, but he bent over and wrote on the ground with his finger. As they stood there asking him questions, he straightened up and said to them, Whichever one of you has committed no sin may throw the first stone at her. Then he bent over again and wrote on the ground. When they heard this, they all left, one by one, the older ones first. Jesus was left alone with the woman still standing there. He straightened up and said to her, Where are they? Is there no one left to condemn you? She answered, No one, sir. And Jesus replied, Well then, I do not condemn you either. You may go, but do not sin again. 
Jesus spoke to the Pharisees again. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life and will never walk in darkness. The Pharisees said to him, Now you are testifying on your own behalf. What you say proves nothing. Jesus answered, No, even though I do testify on my own behalf, what I say is true, because I know where I came from and where I am going. You do not know where I came from or where I am going. You make judgments in a purely human way. I pass judgment on no one. But if I were to do so, my judgment would be true, because I am not alone in this. The Father who sent me is with me. It is written in your law that when two witnesses agree, what they say is true. I testify on my own behalf, and the Father who sent me also testifies on my behalf. They asked him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Jesus said all this as he taught in the temple, in the room where the offering boxes were placed, and no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Again Jesus said to them, I will go away, you will look for me, but you will die in your sins. You cannot go where I am going. So the Jewish authorities said, He says we can't go where he's going. Does this mean that he will kill himself? Jesus answered, You belong to this world here below, but I come from above. You are from this world, but I am not from this world. That is why I told you that you will die in your sins. And you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am who I am. Who are you? they asked him. Jesus answered, What I have told you from the very beginning. I have much to say about you, much to condemn you for. The one who sent me, however, is truthful, and I tell the world only what I have heard from him. They did not understand that Jesus was talking to them about the Father. So he said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am who I am. Then you will know that I do nothing on my own authority, but I say only what the Father has instructed me to say. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, because I always do what pleases him. Many who heard Jesus say these things believed in him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, because of the life-giving water that flowed from your side and that still flows in each believer's inner being, we can truly say with the psalmist, You are near to me, Lord. How we love your word with its instructions, commands, and teachings. As Psalm 119 also says, Your love never changes. Lord, we pray that you would give us each day, even each moment, the light of life, so that we never walk in darkness. Lord, we praise you for how you could perfectly uphold the law in the confrontation about the woman caught in the act of adultery. And at the same time, you convicted her accusers of their own sin and hypocrisy. Your eyes were looking down at the ground, but your spirit convicted their hearts. And you perfectly forgave the woman's sin while warning her not to sin again. Today, Lord, we feel your Spirit similarly convicting our hearts. We confess our sins to you and ask for the light of life and 
life-giving water to purify our hearts.